morning, I invite you to enjoy a panel discussion and I will hand it over to Brian Hall, Senior Vice President and Executive Director of the Greater Flume Partnership Equity and Inclusion Program. Brian. Thank you, Jake. And uh, wow, what powerful information. Thanks for sharing that. I also like to uh, send out our thanks to both Bill and Alan for their discussion this morning. Mm -hmm. And in general, to Team Neo and all the sponsors for this event today. Well, I'm excited to be able to moderate a discussion uh, amongst three leaders in our community that will give some perspective. Um, and I'm going to allow them an opportunity to introduce themselves. I just want to start by uh, commenting also to just on uh, the starkness of the data. Uh, and I'm going to ask our panelists that question after their introduction. Um, but it is just um, for those of us who work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, uh, it's becoming more and more evident that for our region to be prosperous and to succeed, we not only have to improve this, we have to improve it transformationally. Uh, everything that Jake just outlined also is overlaid by the fact that uh, the minority communities in our region are growing faster than the non-minority communities. So that makes this data exponentially challenging, which means the gaps will grow and not shrink. Also, in addition to income and unemployment, the wealth gap uh, across the United States has been said, and I think this was a McKinsey study, that African Americans would move to median zero wealth by 2043 at the current trend, and that it's Hispanics would follow in three years, 2046. Now think about that if our population is majority minority, that will have a majority population with zero wealth. So it, it calls for transformational change, and we're gonna talk about some of that. I, I love the comments that uh, Alan made about Metro Health and the things they're doing. I like to love the information that Bill shared and how Team Neo is addressing this with partners. And it certainly is uh, very much on the radar and will be part of um, our new strategic refresh at General at um, GCP, the Greater Cleveland Partnership that will be announced in September. So with that, I'm gonna turn to our panelists and ask if each of them would just take about 30 seconds and introduce themselves. And I'm gonna come right back to you with our first question. Um, I do want to uh, give acknowledgement for Debbie Conley that she is on the phone and uh, is in one of our communities that's being impacted by the power outage. And hopefully, Debbie, you were able to join us by phone. Uh, but I'll start with you, Terrell, then Victor, then Debbie. Please uh, introduce yourself to our audience. I'll be still on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, Terrell Dillard, uh, president of Zaymat Distributors and JamPro Cleaning and Disinfecting. Zaymat Distributors is a full service industrial safety and fuel supply business um, with uh, operations in about six states around the country. Uh, Zaymat um, is uh, Ohio's Minority Business of the Year for 2020. Uh, JamPro is the world's number one fastest growing cleaning franchise. Uh, we sell uh, franchises throughout the Cleveland, Akron, and Toledo markets with over 200 franchise owners locally and servicing about 700 customers here in the area. Thanks, Sean. Congratulations, Victor. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Victor Ruiz, Executive Director of Esperanza. Esperanza provides support services to Cleveland's Latinx community uh, to help our youth uh, get promoted and succeed along the educational pipeline. So thank you. Thank you, Victor. And Debbie, I see you, you've come off mute. I have, thank you. Um, good morning, this is Debbie Connolly. I am I'm apologizing in advance for the nightmare of technology experience if I've had this morning um, between the power and Wi-Fi being out at my house and then thinking I was going to head to the office for some refuge, but um, we don't have internet here either. So I am on the phone and um, I am the Chief People Officer and SVP of Human Resources at Highland Software. We are located in Westlake. Um, 
focusing a lot of our efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion around the globe, um, not just here in Northeast Ohio. But today we'll talk primarily about what's happening here in Northeast Ohio, as well as our um, 20 some offices across the US um, and looking forward to, to sharing some of what, what we've got going on. So thanks for having me this morning and for dealing with the um, technology issues I'm having. Debbie, you're coming in loud and clear. So uh, except that we couldn't enjoy you on camera, everything is working beautifully. I'm gonna come back to you with the first question. I'd like you all to react to this. Um, this is the comment from uh, Bill Kaler's uh, introduction to the misaligned opportunities report. It's clear, however, from both personal accounts of many in our community and through our robust analysis of data that economic success that has not been equitable and opportunities to prosper have not been equal to all members of our community, particularly people of color. With that, um, I'd like, Debbie, for you to start. What is your reaction to the misaligned opportunities report? The opportunity, the misaligned opportunities report is, it is the data is, is staggering to me. There um, is significant underrepresentation in all levels within our organizations. And um, despite the efforts that are taking place with organizations to partner more deeply within their communities and within our communities, um, we're still seeing these and we're seeing them at Highland on the part of qualified applicants. So for us, that means digging deeper into the communities to, to train and to coach and to advise and to guide um, the school districts on, on how to provide this, this training and this education and this, and this foundation for the students as they graduate from, from high school and decide to either enter a college um, or not, whether it's a community college or a four-year university. Um, or if they go right into the workforce and decide to get a certification or not, um, it really it depends on all of us um, within the industry to to stress the importance to recognize what's happening with the data um, and to train and guide these students at young ages about the opportunities that are available to them to build our candidate pools because without those candidate pools to pull from, there is no growth in diversifying our, our organizations. And if you can't diversify your applicant pool and you can't diversify your, your entry level roles within your organization, how are you gonna grow though? What, what pool are you gonna pull from to grow and to promote within your organization? So um, the data is there in front of us and it takes, it's gonna take all of us to, to look, to analyze and, and to do something about it. Thanks, Debbie. Victor, your reaction to the report. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, two two points. Uh, first, um, yeah, the data is staggering, and, and it confirms what a lot of us have known for a long time. Uh, those of us who have been on the ground, you know, uh, pounding the table about this for a long time, have been seeing it, experiencing it. So this, again, validates and confirms what we've already known. Uh, and, and the other point that for me really stuck out is that, you know, this looks at the region as a whole, and I think there may be some things that could be missed. One, and I'll give the example of the Latinx community. You know, while the Latinx community is just 5% of the region, in Cleveland is 15%. So that different parts of our region are impacted more significantly by this. And we all know for Cleveland, for example, if our region wants to be successful, Cleveland needs to be successful so that we may need to create specific strategies and pay special attention to specific parts of the region so that the region as a whole can prosper. Excellent point, Victor. Thank you. Terrell, your reaction to the report. Sure, I agree with Victor. Um, the report is the report uh, and many of us, especially in minority communities, we're ready for the real change. We're ready for the real dialogue. Um, the numbers are important, obviously, uh, as a starting point. Um, but I think, uh, and Debbie alluded to, how do we uh, get outside the box within our organizations? 
How do we uh, set up a, a, a portal, if you will, uh, that addresses our, our, our talent drain and addresses the educational issues that we have? Because it does start young. Um, I, I think I told you this recently, Brian, I'm 51 years old. I grew up in Northeast Ohio. Uh, I'm on my way to an Ivy League school at 18. I had never met an African-American business owner. I had never met an African-American attorney doctor, engineer. Um, and so how do you achieve it if you can't see it? Uh, diversifying our, our organizations, diversifying our neighborhoods really has to be intentional. And that's what I received from the report is just, you know, when do we start the hard work? Great, thanks Terrell. And I also meant to mention and congratulate you on your recent appointment to the Team Neo Board where you'll be able to push some of the work that you're, we're gonna talk about today. So Debbie, I want to turn to back to you because um, you know we talk about the misalignment of opportunities, and we often quickly turn to turn to the pipeline and to the entry level skills and certification. There was a statistic in the report also about the lack of diversity in management, uh, the misaligned uh, opportunity. I think six percent uh, of managed positions were filled by diverse individuals. So how at Highland are you looking at addressing the underrepresentation in leadership and how can DNI DNI efforts uh, where there is potentially a pipeline problem at the same time identify those individuals who I would argue are in organizations and, and yet underrepresented in their advancement into leadership? Well, any company truly com committed to DEI should should examine the diversity of their organization. Devan look at the the diversity of their workforce and consider underrepresentation across all dimensions, whether it's race, race, ethnicity, gender, age, physical, and mental ability, um, geographic location, and and any other component and Underrepresented employees need to see, and this has been referenced a few times, need to see others like them across the company, and and they need to see them in leadership. And this is in in order to to show that they are equally valued and equally valuable, um, and leaders especially, they're in positions to affect the organizational climate around inclusion. Um, belonging and and how that's cultivated in and among our teams in order to create an environment where everyone can bring their full self and their best self to work. So it's 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 engaging. It doesn't it, it's it's not just that that DEI committee or that DEI position within an organization. It's all of us at leadership levels who need to look very closely at what's happening among our teams and within our teams to say hey, who am I looking at? Who am I considering? How do I value the people I have on my team? And are there others across the organization that I could help advance um, even outside my team? So it's, it's looking at the, at the skill sets. It's looking at, at, at all levels within your organization. And, and, um, and like, I, like I mentioned, all underrepresented, um, all underrepresented um, individuals across the organization. Thanks, Debbie. And, and I think you would also agree and maybe are alluding to the succession planning, mentorship and advancement as you as you look at those things. Uh, one of the comments that I've heard from a HR professional, uh, a, a woman says she has seen in organizations where certain groups get ta taught and other groups get tested. And if you think about that for a moment, it's our bias that might allow us to look at a certain individual and say, let's groom that individual and let's teach that individual for, to get to the next level. And then look at other individuals, women and other diverse individuals to say, let's test that individual and see if they're ready for the next level. And that slight difference, I think, um, uh, added to what, what you just talked about in terms of examining your corporate policies is what we've all started to work on more more so than ever in the past. Uh, Victor, 
how can companies boost minority talent development and training to be com competitive? And I know through Esperanza, you're working with the earliest, early part of that pipeline. Uh, you've been at this a long time. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, I um, think uh, companies, employers uh, need to be proactive in creating their own pipelines. And that really starts by um, starting early. And for us, We've really been working hard over the last, especially five years, on educating um, companies, corporations, on, on our talent pool here, homegrown Latinx talent, bilingual, well-educated, who want to stay here, um, so that you, know, you have your talent here. You don't have to recruit all over the world. You can get it here. And the other is um, you know, really pushing them to invest in developing that talent through internships. You know, I think one of the hardest things we've done is really connect our students to internships. Uh, there's just a lot of reasons why our students are having a hard time connecting from obviously competition to uh, organizations not having um, a, 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 a structured internship program to really, you know, helping people understand why they need to invest in our students. So I would say, Brian, you know, again, investing in their talent pipeline, which includes creating robust internship and co-op opportunities and bringing in these students and connecting them with those mentors and those uh, development opportunities that could help them get acclimated to the culture of the institution and also develop the skills that will allow them to grow within the company. Have you seen some uh, examples or case studies you'd like to highlight where, where that has worked and want to promote that? We've got an audience of almost 200 people. <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. But, you know, I, I would say that one no, place where... You don't where, have to name the particular company if you don't want to. Th that's true. You know, I, you know but, but I will because I think it's important to highlight. I think KeyBank does a really good job with their internship and talent development program. And we've had a great success with that with KeyBank and not just helping uh, students understand the culture, but also helping them understand how you get promoted within the institution and company. And by starting here, here's the path for you to get here. And uh, that has worked extremely well with our students. Thanks. Terrell, a question for you about um, companies looking to attract diverse talent. Uh, you, you've uh, shared with me your career pathway. You've been both in the professional uh, ranks before you became an entrepreneur. What's your thoughts on how business owners and companies should be looking to attract the first step? I think it's, uh, there's a couple of prongs that um, I think have to uh, work um, together in, 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 in attracting uh, good talent uh, can also be um, difficult if you're not looking for diverse talent. Um, and so many times it, 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 it might not just come to you because you um, have a DNI goal or you have a DNI department or you know you have some initiative, you really have to look and you have to identify those key organizations uh, like Victor's. I mean, uh, again, he's been doing uh, work in the community for many, many years. Um, if, if you want something, you have to go get it. Um, and I, I think it, it can be done in a small community like Cleveland. Um, we could uh, showcase our talent and be a model uh, for the rest of the country. But we, we have to, all of us uh, on this uh, call, all 200 of us, uh, have to be able to talk. Um, any good team sport, uh, communication is key. Um, and you have to constantly be talking amongst one another to play offense and defense. Uh, and I think if we are a little more intentional uh, and we reward those companies who are doing it right, and we highlight, uh, we should be naming those companies who are doing it right and addressing um, the elephant in the room. Um, and it shouldn't be, I can donate 20,000 to a golf outing and, and, and cover my DNI. Uh, a goal for the, the year. Um, how can I use those funds to really get into the community? Uh, if you're looking for talent, uh, just ask. Uh, ask the right people uh, and make it known that we're looking for a Black engineer. We're looking for more uh, uh, minority sales 
uh, people in our organization, and I'm sure Brian can identify one or two, uh, but you have to ask. Thanks, Terrell. You know, uh, Debbie, I want you to come, oh, you're already coming. I wanted you to comment on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to, to jump in a little bit because what we're finding is organizations, and I, I'm not, I don't want to point fingers, but there are organizations doing very targeted searches in using LinkedIn, which is great if you're if, if you're looking for experienced talent, but what they're 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 targeting are are diverse individuals who are already employed um, with other organizations, and they're, and they're pulling them from one organization locally to their organization locally, and they're doing that. I know they're doing that to boost their own numbers, but what it's doing is it's 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 they're, we're, we're losing them with from the organization that's put in time and effort to growing them. So it's not only looking and doing, and, and it's not only looking at the experienced talent, but it's it's broadening your and diversifying your search um, at that entry level as well. So whether it's through um, groups like the National Association of Black Engineers for us, or National Association of Women in Sales Professionals, or it's whether um, Association of Latino Professionals in America. It's, it's all of these organizations, but, but there are many more just locally within our own community that we can look to um, that, that the others on the panel have referenced. So it's also um, developing and expanding campus um, recruiting strategies. And when I say campus, I'm not just talking about colleges and universities, it's going into those high schools and allowing them to showcase their skills, whether it's through an innovation challenge or just getting to know them and letting them get to know you and your organization and you're open to accepting them and hiring them as candidates within your organization. And, and it's just events and partnerships within you know, diverse, diverse campus organizations or campus association, um, events at HBCUs um, or Hispanic um, colleges and universities and, and hiring those interns and whether it is interns who are working on projects while they're while they're at school or whether it's interns who are working during the summer, during spring break, during summer break or Christmas break. It's all of those, it's those opportunities where they can witness what it's like to be part of your organization and to experience your culture and the work that you are having them do and 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 the challenges that you're providing to them, um, and and along with those challenges comes all kinds of development opportunities for those for those interns um, and co-ops, and it's also asking um, it's asking your employees to be your to be advocates and to be ambassadors on within the high schools and within the the universities that they attend, um, and and you know. And, and establishing a diverse candidate pool, um, diverse individuals referring diverse individuals, and it's it's just truly it's it, it's 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 a lot of work. It's a lot of communication. It's a lot of transparency, but but it builds those pools of candidates, and it builds trust with your organization, and it builds respect for your organization and the opportunities that you have to offer. I mean, I want to build on where you're headed there um, and stay on this question a little bit in terms of talent attraction because I sit in a number of meetings where uh, well-intentioned leaders start to talk about recruiting outside the region and, and uh, changing our strategies and using HBCUs. But I want to ask uh, for a little bit about two things. When you think about our region and our the culture of our region, is there has to be some part of this systemic problem that is our corporate culture, not just on the individuals and their ability to have the skills and to move forward. Because even, even in the case of the Ivy League student, Terrell, uh, or Victor, the Latinx high performing student, we don't see more than two African American CEOs. We don't see more than three or four female CEOs. We don't see any Latinx CEOs in our region. Um, and so what I guess what I want you guys to think or talk about is uh, it's a given that we have to work on all the other things, but what do I, what do we have to do to project a different image to our region that would 
make us attractive, make us a, a mecca, make us a place where people say, hey, if I work in that area, uh, I'm gonna find more people like me. Any thoughts on that? Uh, Terrell, I'll, I'll call on you first and Victor and Debbie, you get a chance to think about it a little bit. Well, Debbie uh, brought up a good, um, I should say issue. Um, there is talent among us. And uh, conversely, as we are drained by uh, our, our star players uh, that are recruited to other companies in the region, there are some others, uh, and someone mentioned it earlier, some other talent that can just be coached. But then it can be shared um, that we have exceptional talent that is ready to move into X position. Uh, and we're in this together, um, um, all for one. How do we identify the company that this individual, uh, this minority individual specifically, uh, can move up in the ranks? And so it might not be here, but it, it's a difficult uh, position to be in, I'm sure. You know, we've all had great talent uh, taken away from us, but if this is our goal, again, we have to get outside the box, we have to be a little more uncomfortable, and we have to identify those positions where our local talent uh, can stay in the region um, and not be recruited outside the region. I, I think there's, uh, again, just so much more conversation around how can we be intentional about identifying our, our gaps and, and making it happen. Um, uh, my son recently graduated a couple years ago and he was recruited uh, to go work in New York City. So if you hear some noise in the background, it's my wife crying, but you know, we're moving him to New York City in a couple of weeks. And it is bittersweet because he was one uh, born and bred in Northeast Ohio and came back uh, uh, purposely to uh, be a larger fish in a smaller pond. Um, but obviously there has to be the opportunities that also attract, um, and it's a holistic approach. You know, what are we providing? What kind of housing opportunities can we get uh, 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 folks to participate in so we can recruit that talent downtown? How can we offer uh, the, the retail and all that other good stuff that uh, young guys are looking for and, and women are looking for? And so I, I think it's holistic. I, I know we're, we're sort of beating a dead horse, but it, it you know, this is just the start of a discussion that uh, we should have, and, and and maybe it has to be offline and outside of uh, 200 people. But you know, there are some solutions, um, and 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 they're radical. I mean, that's just the only uh, way to to change. You know, looking at the report, and you're seeing a one percent tick up or down. Um, and I think you mentioned that, Brian. It, you know, do we wait till 2046 um, to uh, level? the playing field, um, or how can we just be radical? Uh, how can we sign up, identify those companies that are serious about uh, change and helping them? And, and I think the conversation starts there. Thanks, Terrell. Victor? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Terrell. I think my comments will complement that. I think one, it's incumbent on us to create the environment that makes people, young people want to stay and people want to come here. So. Uh, so that's that's one. Second, you know, I think, you know, we, we need to make not just a professional com commitment to DEI, but there's also has to be a personal commitment to DEI. And I think one of the challenges we have in recruiting is that we have uh, very homogeneous networks. We tend to interact with people who look like us, who live in our neighborhood, so that when we're looking to network and expand, we have a very limited number of people we could turn to. Brian. Terrell, I'm sure you're you're used to people saying, "Hey, can you connect me?" You know, I get the same. So there has to be a personal and professional commitment to this. Uh, the other thing is um, we have to be intentional. We have to, you know, I call out and identify the diversity that we want to see, and we have to commit to getting that. And um, and along with that is, you know, I I'm personally tired of hearing. You know, we want diversity, but they have to be qualified. It's there. It's diversity and qualified, and they are out there, and make the commitment and effort to to get it. So. Thanks, Debbie, and and uh, 
We're going to try to squeeze in one more question, and I see we've got about five questions in the chat. I'm just going to go quickly because much of what I was planning to say has been said um, already, but it's it's also it's it's about creating the environment and about creating the culture um, where where we see more of who we are within organizations and. And it is truly personal in in making those decisions on where we want to work. So as I'm an individual coming out of high school or coming out of a program at Tri-C or Cleveland State or anywhere, it is what do I, where do I want to be? And what does that organization look like from, a, from an employee perspective and from a leadership perspective? Or do they offer the programming that meets me where I am in life? Do they offer... Um, the benefits that meets me that meet me where I am in life and and do I see others that look like me in and can I look to them for guidance on policies and procedures and how to get things done within that organization so it's establishing those those mentoring relationships and establishing those guides and it's become more difficult this year um, with everybody working remotely but there, we, we can make it work and it can be personal. It really just has to, we have to truly focus and work hard on establishing these personal relationships within our organization and holding our employees accountable, our leaders especially, for forming those relationships and those, mentor, those mentoring circles, um, in, in, in my opinion. Great. Well, those, those are three great answers. And I wanted to dwell on that just a little bit. Um, uh, as a preview to some of the work that the partnership uh, is going to announce. And I think one of you said that we've got to be intentional. We've got to create a focus on it. Um, we intend to do just that with our partners, Team Neo and others. I'm going to squeeze in one last question and we'll go to the chat. This is for you, Terrell, because we haven't talked about minority suppliers. What role does this play in attracting talent and, and how are they a vital part of the ecosystem and creating opportunities? Yeah, I, I've thought obviously uh, a lot about this topic as a minority supplier over the years and, you know, attending the various networking and um, matchmaking functions. It, 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 my answer just can't change. It, it's about being intentional. Um, and I saw one of the case studies um, where uh, the Hall of Fame Village and Stark uh, County Minority Business Association identifying opportunities for uh, minority suppliers. Uh, I was one of those suppliers that they reached out to. Um, we we have more than enough uh, NAICS codes to 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 get on the uh, jobs in the area, the infrastructure jobs, and we are on quite a few of them uh, in the area. But there are also organizations like Stark County Minority Business that were intentional and reached out and said, "We we we need you on this job." Um, they knew we had the capacity, but um, during those preliminary discussions, we're not at the table. So somebody was at the table uh, that could identify um, minority companies. And, and I think that's important, having people in your boardroom or at the table uh, that, can, that can do the real work. Um, uh, Metro Health Hospital is another great uh, example, one of our uh, good customers. We supply uh, diesel fuel to Metro Health, and um, it started with someone at Metro Health reaching out. Um, what do you supply, uh, Zaymad, and how can we participate? And in, in, in there are also other um, mentor protege programs around the country that work really well. That public private partnership works well when we're talking about building infrastructure. Uh, that same public-private partnership can be used and, and copied to build an organization that's inclusive. Um, and suppliers uh, are just conduits. And so it's tough uh, to not work with suppliers. I'm providing the same widget uh, that you can get from another competitor. Um, we own the PPE contract for the state of Utah. Uh, and so I sell more PPE in Utah than I do in Northeast Ohio. Um, I can take some of that blame for it. You know, how do I, can I be more intentional? Because I have access, we, we have the supply. Um, and um, are we being collaborative uh, to include each other at the table? It's, it's, it's again, a, a three-pronged approach in that public-private uh, conversation 
uh, sometimes needs to be in public, sometimes it needs to be private in order to get it done. So we're all uh, working on the same accord. Thank you. Um, great, great, great conversation. I wish we had more time for that. I keep seeing the questions in the chat go up. So I'm gonna turn to uh, Sandra, let her read the questions and I'll direct them to either of you. Well, let's, let's try to get rapid fire answers and maybe we can get through all of them, thanks. Nope, we didn't get Sandra, so I'll uh, read the first one. Have you seen a shift or considered one up in recruiting requirements across your companies? Perhaps considering associate level degrees where in the past it was a four year degree required. As mentioned earlier on the call, it's important to expand the thought about what makes a qualified candidate. Uh, I'm gonna stop there because I think you got the gist of that question. I'm gonna toss that to you, Debbie. Yes, it's it's, we're seeing it across industries, um, opening up the, I guess the the requirements and and seeing looking, I should say, adding more value to experience than to um, certifications and degrees, um, and doing that is allowing that candidate pool to grow. And we are finding there are there, especially in technology, there are candidates who are coming out of high school, who are just as qualified because of the work they've been doing, not only with their curriculum, um, but also in you know projects that they've been working on outside of school, some of the gaming that they've been developing and working on, um, those, they, they, they often have more skills and a broader skill set than some of the um, individuals coming right out of school. So yes, that is absolutely happening um, within technology, I can tell you for sure. Great. Well, that's great because you segued into the next question was really around um, you know, how great it is to see the focus on student programming to fill high demand jobs like IT. Uh, but we also know that we got to take steps uh, with students before they get out of college. And this question refers to business schools being overwhelmingly white. How can we also support careers in business to support in demand jobs like finance, operations and HR? Terrell, I'm gonna to toss that one to you. So, you know, the educational component um, is, is, is difficult um, because it starts so early. Um, you know, as, as young as pre-K, again, and putting those images in front of students uh, that might not have uh, the, the greater opportunities. Um, but if you look at, um, you know, many organizations, you know, I think about the Diversity Center of Greater Cleveland, um, doing the real work uh, in colleges. When you, when, you, when you talk about what can we do before graduation, imagine being a uh, white college student who attended a predominantly white high school, uh, who is being recruited by a company and eventually moves up the latter. Um, at what point did they receive uh, the diversity training that's necessary to make hiring decisions, to make the important, understand the cultural differences so you can manage effectively? Um, it starts early. And if, if we don't make it a holistic approach where we, we recognize as a college, we don't have any uh, uh, minority professors, or we don't have administrators that these students feel comfortable reaching out to because they share that experience. Uh, you can't discount the familiarity um, and how comfortable someone is, I, I think, as, as Debbie said, by having their, their peers look like them. Um, and it just starts early, you know, it, you know what, what's going on at this particular high school uh, that it might impact these students for a lifetime, um, you know, and, uh, you know, no different than bullying. How do we nip that in the bud? Um, well, there's, there's other forms of bullying, you know, when you're the only uh, woman in the organization um, of men, when you're the only minority in the entire organization or one of two, um, how do we make those individuals um, feel comfortable enough? And again, 
we can wait for that that gradual change, that that one percent tick, or we can say, you know what, it's not acceptable. We're we're going all in, um, and we're going to open it up, you know, for the real conversation. I'm going to keep coming back to that answer, uh, Brian. But you know, the real work um, has to begin, um, and and it has to be radical. Where we look up, and I say this often when I when I speak, if you're looking. For real change, it has to be something that you're willing to say, you know what, in 10 years, we're going to be on 60 minutes with this program. In 10 years, we're going to be on 2020 uh, with this program. And they're going to highlight Cleveland and, and the real work we did um, from this conversation. Um, if we're not prepared to be that radical where we can be highlighted in 10 years nationally, um, how real um, uh, is that opportunity and, and, and how real is this discussion? Uh, how important is this report? Um, if we're not willing to say that's not good enough and we don't have time um, because we'll we'll outpace, you know, we get over our skis and and, and now we're in trouble, <laughs> you know, and, and that's easy to get into um, in today's climate. You know, I'm, I'm you going know, to, I, go ahead, Debbie. Sorry, I was just gonna add, I was no. just gonna add one more thing and that is, not Please only with, with being brave, right? And being willing to have those conversations, we have to hold our organizations. We have to look up and we have to look down and we have to look across and we have to hold people accountable. Our leadership team specifically um, in, 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 in their ability to consider diversity an important topic and an ability to act with diversity and inclusion in mind. Um, if we're, you know, we can be all talk as an organization, but number one, if we're not providing the training and the education and the open conversations from the top down to our leadership teams to say, this is what we expect of you. And if you have questions about how to navigate these waters, let us help you. Um, but also we have to, we have to look across and hold each other accountable. Thanks, Debbie. You know, and, and I, I'll be remiss if I don't mention this. Uh, because we've talked about this from the standpoint of the prosperity of our region. Uh, a company owner, particularly a metal mic market, uh, male, by company owner doing all right, may say, well, what's, what's in this for me? I mean, I'm, I'm doing okay today. And it reminded me last year, there was a news release. It didn't get a lot of publicity, but the NASDAQ announced and, and went to the SEC and said, we don't want to list any new companies on our stock exchange that don't have a diverse board. And while it seemed like that was in relation to what was going on in our country socially, what they said in the next part of the release was that they had done a study of the performance of the companies that had diverse leadership versus the companies that didn't. And that the distinction in performance was so great that they felt that it was their fiduciary responsibility to stockholders, to shareholders, to require diverse boards. That is performance related. And at the same time, uh, last year, I think it was McKinsey that did the study of venture capital firms and found the exact same thing, 8% to 9% better performance from venture capital firms that had female and ethnic diversity in their leadership. So I just didn't want uh, us to close this session without um, thinking about this from the perspective of we want to have companies that are the best performers. This isn't just about, you know, what can we do to, to, to have a more equitable society? It's a better performing society. So I just wanted to mention that. Victor, the next question I'm going to send to you, it's, um, I'm going to combine these two questions. They're both around, uh, first of all, the students who were sentenced to remote, remote learning, uh, because of the pandemic and the impact that that may have on their future and what will companies do to help train those students. And then the second question is around uh, what uh, this question it says, we used to have a robust region-wide internship program. Where does that stand today? And since you work in this field, uh, maybe you can answer both of those combined. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely we've had more alignment in the past around um, internships. Uh, you know, from as close to a shared vision to actually working collaboratively. I will say candidly from my experience, um, I don't see that as much anymore and it seems to be more siloed. Uh, but 
it is uh, imperative that we uh, come together as a region to create a, a strategy around internships and co-ops uh, as a way to ensure that we have the right pipeline uh, of, of employees. Um, and then as it relates to the remote work and employers, you know, we, we still don't know the impact of remote work in the pandemic on learning last year. I know the Cleveland School District is working really hard to close those gaps, you know, with a robust summer program and um, various um, enrichment options. But I'll go back to a comment I said earlier that I do believe that corporations and employers need to be proactive in helping to develop um, and train and create their pipeline. And that starts early. So um, I do agree with the, uh, the question that employers need to be proactive in helping to create that, so. Great. Thanks. So we are at the uh, hour we need to close. I want to uh, do so by thanking you, Terrell, Victor, and Debbie, for the great conversation to the audience for all of your questions and your participation. Um, it's been an excellent discussion this morning. Uh, before we close, though, I would ask that those who are on, please stay tuned for a message from Bill Kaler. Um, thank you all very much. Thanks so much. Thank you all for sharing this time together and for your engagement in these critical issues. I hope that this program provided you with a deeper understanding and appreciation of the need to enhance our collective approach to eliminating inequities and increase opportunities around educational achievement, workforce development, healthcare access, and other aspects of life. Our misaligned opportunities report demonstrates, and as our esteemed guests this morning further emphasized, developing diverse talent equitably from within our own ecosystem and attracting diverse individuals to our community because they see opportunity to thrive will be critical to achieving a truly vibrant economy in Northeast Ohio. We will send the misaligned opportunities report to each of you as a follow-up to this meeting. You can also find the report as well as our previous economic research at teamneo.org. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.